<laughs> in the unlikely uh, case that we say something interesting, we don't lose it. Good. All right. Whew. Yeah, it's too bad last time we had to, we actually had to stop because it felt like we were really on a roll. And I, I suppose I know that the way it's supposed to work is you can always get back in flow, but I, I sometimes uh, feel like that's not going to happen. So let's see. We'll see. I will certainly say that there was a momentum effect. As soon as we hit off, I was like, I'm out of here. Went for a walk and didn't listen to anything, but just metabolized a lot of different threads. And uh, it was, it was good. So you know, there was a, there, there was a moment most of the way through uh, it, it was when we shifted the conversation to start talking about uh, the military industrial complex in kind of big quotes. Yep. Um, and you had sort of a, hmm, something just dropped for me. Yep. Maybe that's a good place to start. So yep. from that place, mm -hmm. what, you know, what dropped for you or what's the shift um, yep. from there? So that was an alignment. Uh, I'm often thinking about the connection um, between, so one of my big insights had to do, as you know, with this justification systems theory. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, oh, we network our beliefs together into these systems of legitimizing is and ought, and that's how we're really coordinating our shit, okay? Um, and what that does is it provides a really clear angle on the animal to human culture. That's why I call it capital C culture and the culture person uh, dimension of existence on the TOK, okay? But there's always an interesting relationship between what the network of culture or capital C culture person justification is and society. Okay. Um, and I'm always looking for threads in which how does that system of justification get translated into complicated societal structures? How does it get translated into material culture? And how does it get it translated into certain types of societal complexes, industrial complexes? Okay. So one of the things that dropped at that moment was the justification systems that we were building around game A. What was happening in modernity, legitimizing a particular way of being in the world the powers that gave rise to that, and then the evolution of that coming off of then post-World War II and what it meant for the cluster of organizations of me as an American in relationship to the USSR. And what sunk for me there at another, so the justification identity network system just went another level deeper of fit and that was good for me at the level of huh the echoes of these waves and the manifestations that they become at the level of well the industry of that is society okay so it's all this we have these justifications and when we're doing oral indigenous it's you know it's you and me in a complex dynamic cooperative conversation but then people get together and they create laws, they create economic systems, and create that macro level shell structure. I think that understanding that interface um, is central, uh, both to understand where we've been and to understand where we're headed. Okay, so yeah, I feel like there's something really, really close and big here. <clears throat> and I can also feel that feeling of uh, uh, rock climbing on a very, very sheer granite wall. Um, the first thing that came up for me was what, what may be sort of broad, but frankly broadly useful and also useful for me and us is to zoom in on, I'm, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna call it right now, I'm gonna call it grammar. Um, and at least right now, I'm, I'm also going to point to what I mean by that, recognizing that I might mean more than I think I mean, <laughs> All right. mm -hmm. um, which is the, okay, so what I was really, I was really feeling into the uncanny fact 
that for some reason, there is a distinct capacity to distinguish between sense and nonsense, mm. right? Okay. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that distinction grammar. Okay. Right, and, and what I mean, and you, you pointed out to this, you talked about systems of justification, is and ought. And you and I both know, like I sent you that paper that I had a very compatible insight at roughly the same time. It was weird. Um, it was weird. It, it, it was. Uh, no, and I had literally a 96, 97. That's yeah, literally 96, 97. Yeah, 96, 97, 97, and a very similar sensation of, of almost obsession where, I, okay, I have mm -hmm. to struggle with this and write it down. So the, the point being that humans, persons, have a facility, and I guess from a Chomsky, Chomskyan perspective, maybe in fact a uh, sort of hardwired facility for first and foremost, distinguishing uh, between valid and invalid utterances of sense. And here I'm also invoking uh, uh, Gilles and uh, logic of sense. Okay. Uh, so, so when you say we have a system of justification, mm -hmm. we have, it feels like almost like three things that are triangulating and grammar is the more fundamental. So, I've got the isness, I've got the oughtness, and I've got the grammar. And they're, yeah. they're very subtly intertwined. Agreed. All right, so the, the isness, whew, okay, this, this is getting right down to that little nub of it. The isness has to do with the, again, it's, it's really interesting. The, the felt sense of the, the rightness of what I was, I suppose I would call a chain of inference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think she got frustrated trying to get a shoe off. Okay, right. Well, that's, there are different kinds of cries in the world. I remember that as a parent of three. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> different kinds of cries in the world. And there, maybe that's a good little hint. You know, we have, we have prior to this grammatical construct, we definitely have utterances that carry some signification and orient right. towards some, some action, some choice. Totally. And so there's a, a pattern, there's a pattern recognition, and there's a, a mapping between different pattern constructs. Right. So for example, probably base below grammar, we have things like causation as a sense. Right? So we have some sense that there are events, and then we have, and those events have causes, mm -hmm. um, and they have effects. Right. And that there's a, uh, a deeply hardwired uh, orientation towards right judgment, right discernment, you know, okay. to, to correctly discern the cause of something and or correctly discern the effect of something is very, very baseline. And we exact or repurpose that deeper, and probably by the way, neurologically deeper uh, pattern recognition machinery in the context simultaneously of the horizontal connectedness of words. You know, the word that follows that word is somehow appropriately oriented such that there is a causal effect like by, by uh, feeling to it. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the cl classic associationist sensibility that there is also a cogency where the, the, the simulated reality that is being produced in my mind as a consequence of the series of phonemes that are being bounced off my ears has a sense of coordination with the reality that yep. I'm experiencing in a different mode. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that's what I'm putting out there right now. For some reason, it feels like zooming in on that is, is, okay. is an important place to go and we can build up from there. And I'm holding, by the way, here, your, your sort of point about the relationship between systems of justification and institutions of, and society. Good, okay. So now this point is the point that I've honed in on very deeply, the point that we're on. So the point that I would say, so when I'm honing in on this, there is the attunement that we are able to share in an implicit intersubjective way, okay? Where in fact, we're primates that are really good at reading the intention and attention of others. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. We're better than chimps at this before we have language. Okay. So your two-year-old will learn to point and will intuit 
that you can see and will check back on your shared intention in ways that even adult chimps with training can't do. Okay? Yep. So that, so we're prepped for that. Okay. And, and just as that, a, and just as a little caveat, mm -hmm. um, reading uh, John Heinrich's "The Secrets of Our Success." Mm. That's pretty much the only thing that we actually do better than chimps in a deep way. There, there are a lot of things they do better than us. And yeah, that's a, one of the- At the cognitive level. At the cognitive level, yeah. yeah. And that the, okay. that's one of the striking features of our cognition is its social, communicative, implicit, intersubjective jiving capacity. Okay. Tomasello, Michael Tomasello is a famous cultural anthropologist researcher, emphasizes this, studies it a lot, just came out with a book um, becoming human, a theory of ontogeny. Okay, so I apologize for interrupting. Please continue. Mm -hmm. So, no, that's cool. Um, so anyway, <clears throat> we have this pre-linguistically, and then we, I think we engage in all sorts of collective intelligence rhythming. I think we do it in hunting. I think we do it in gathering. I think we do it in jamming. I think, we, I think there's music. I, th I think then there's symbol connection. Okay, um, and then we're doing that coordination capacity is set, brings us right up to the tipping point of grammar, symbolic syntactical grammar. Okay, so I'm doing I'm saying they're antelope, all right, and we are driving together. We know, hey, we're going to navigate our hunting system over here. We're going to navigate those antelope. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, we have to then find the social group and my personal and your personal motives together. If I say there are the antelope, let's go hunt them. Okay, that's a propositional meaning making statement that has a different cognitive configuration in a big way. All right. And what it what I mean by a big way, it means it creates a network of the external, my thought process and this shared grammar. So now we're synced up differently. And what it does is you can now say, how do you know, okay? Is it accurate? Is the grammar of the accuracy, is, is, does that actually discern and does it map the state of affairs? And we can then say, hey, what's this good for? Me, us. In what way is it good for me, us? What ought to we do, okay? And, and it elevates the space of the claim and it elevates what I call the negative space of the question. The negative space of the question is, hey, how do you know and why should we focus on this now? All right. And questions are negative spaces relative to propositions, meaning they say maybe not. No animal asks questions. Okay. You can't teach chimps to ask questions. Mm. which is really interesting because they can t talk all right. They never ask questions. Okay. So I'm going to make a connection between grammar, propositions, meaning-making statements that can then be counterfactually engaged. Okay. And then that entanglement is going to launch the culture person plane of existence. I have to admit, I got a little hooked on that questions, negative space. Feels like there's a seriously deep implication there. So what does it mean to ask a question? And, and, and the, next, the very next thing that comes up for me is something like, what's the orienting basis towards for which questions? Hmm. Yeah. It seems to me that when you say the negative space, um, a question implies a context. And when a question is asked, one of the things that it does is it imports that context into our shared space. That's what you're saying when you say it's the what negative space. Exactly. Some might call that the frame. Mm hmm And a question is also a little bit of a demand and or an invitation to a shared attention and shared intention. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
And so this one has been circling in my mind now for quite some time. And it feels like it's deeply coordinated with the inquiry around, um, I can't remember what we called it last time, but like the various error conditions in systems of justification. <clears throat> and it has something to do with, so the question is something like, how do we go about asking the best questions? Forrest Landry would have something to say about that. Yes, he would. <laughs> he would indeed. And I, what I like is the idea of trying to do this, noticing that, noticing him, uh, but also you know, out of the nest, yep. doing it on our own and seeing if there's a way for us to, to get something out of it that is not uh, strictly derivative. <laughs> so yeah, the negative space, <clears throat> where's that come from? We're, the other thing to keep in mind here is that we're engaged in social living. So we're being driven from a unified theory perspective by investment and influence. That's what's coordinating us for survival, reproductive success, short, long-term, whatever, we can get into that. But that's the field, this investment influence field, okay? Now we're dropping these propositions into that field and we all have different perspectives on them. And the questions then open up negative potential adjacent space question, you know? Can, you, um, can you actually maybe put this into, to the degree to which you can in a historical timeline? Like where, yep. where are we? Are we in... Um... Like Cro Magnon, are we a hundred thousand? Hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. So this is this is, for, is from your point of view. This is the line. Like this is this the is point the before and after. Exactly. So starting with yeah, hundred thousand, maybe hundred fifty thousand. Who knows? But by fifty thousand, it's tipped and gone. Got it. Okay. So prior to that, we have you know all the deep social animal. Um, machinery having to do with tone of voice and body body disposition and physical location and um, scent and smell and things like that, facial expression. We have some collection of utterances, probably even a collection of utterances that have been reified into distinct utterances that we will call words that have the yep. ability to sort of orient attention in certain directions yep. um, and activate clusters of action potentials that are... Um, within a portfolio of basic actions, grab wood, throw stick, that kind of crap, Yep. Um, which is good, right? There's a whole sort of portfolio of stuff that happens there. And then Big this, deal. this mm -hmm. creates the threshold for this transition. And the transition, yep. uh, as you're saying it, has to do with the emergence of, the emergence of grammar, mm -hmm. the emergence of the possibility of constructing an entirely new object, which is a complicated arrangement of these words in a very specific form that generates propositions. Okay. Nope, oh, you just went completely silent for me. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and you're back. That was weird. All right. I wonder if there's a little wire problem in this. So yeah, so Chomsky, we do Chomsky, although I'm not a full universalist along those lines, but close. Okay, uh, it's a subject object verb relation that creates then a statement that has factual content that can then be referenced and questioned. Yeah, okay, and so then, then, then in an exactly this context, it is the, the abstraction that we, the, 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 the capacity for abstraction in general, that is the moment that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. right? the, yep. the, the, the object that you're describing is an object that lives at the level of abstraction per se. Yes. Now I can now so, utter a, a proposition mm -hmm. and that proposition is an abstraction of a state of affairs. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I have a couple of different interesting problems. One problem is that I could be lying. I could be yep. generating a proposition that is not connected to a state of affairs. Yep. Um, and also I can begin to operate on the machinery of that abstraction yep. to actually do work together in the context of the uncanny resemblance between propositions and states of affairs. Beautiful. So as to achieve higher and higher levels of precise orientation of atten collective attention on states of affairs. Yep. You know, so I can say, um, Hey, Greg, I think the antelope are going to be in the valley down by the river. Right. Say why? 
Well, it's my understanding that it's been dry for a long time and the antelope therefore are very likely to be headed towards the water. Yep. And you might say, that's a very valid proposition and it coordinates with my own modeling of how reality operates. Therefore, I will join you on this particular venture. Totally. Um, and if it turns out that my model, so now the notion of being able to model a construct yep. of propositions that have a series of oh. is that um, framings, Yep. Um, my model, I have a model, I have a way of articulating my model. You have a model, you have a way of articulating your model. We now have a shared model that is being coordinated through this deeper construct, which is the grammar that maintains the integrity of the utterances at all. Right? Exactly. How are we converting what is effectively a random eulation of phenomes into something that has this semantic content? Totally. Now allows for substantially more um, complicated coordinations Yep. Um, with with steps, right? We have temporal steps. We can we can put totally. things in order. We can make plans, <clears throat> and of course, this ooh, this is a big one, right? It's funny. I was actually reading uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead uh, oh. last night. Oh wow! Um, and and you know the opening paragraph. I wish I had it in front of me, but the opening paragraph is like uh, that which can be named must exist. That which can be named names can be written. Oh. That which can be written can be remembered. You know, so. Huh. The thing about propositions, the thing about this abstraction is it also gives rise to the exaptation into writing or at least to mm -hmm. encoding in yep. a medium that is right. indifferent to the embodied, right, right. to the moment. It has a temporal- absolutely central temporal. to our, absolutely central to our second phase. So we're oral indigenous now for the first 50,000 years, 5,000 years ago, 10,000, whatever. But boom, we're gonna, the city and the writing is civilization. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yep. And that propositional network is, is crucial to that. It's, it's, it's irreducible. Like you, can't, you can't do writing until you already have a substrate of, um, and my, you have to have two moves. That Egyptian move is actually pretty powerful. You have to have names mm -hmm. and you have to have a very, very deep sense that there is a strong binding between the name and the thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, the encoding of the name in some medium, say like a clay mm -hmm. tablet, mm -hmm. has a like a, a validity to it, an intrinsic validity to it that you can operate on quite well. Now, of course, from a media analysis perspective, obviously, right, we can invoke a bunch of stuff that happens there. Um, not the least of which is a changing of the landscape of the systems mm -hmm. of justification. Right. As our friend Osiris points out, things that can be written down or will be remembered in ways that are very different than things That's that can right. be merely uttered orally, which totally. changes things like power and gives rise to the kinds of societies that you can design and operate. Right, Hammurabi's code here, I like to put that up. You know, that's like 11 something BC, you know, boom. Now you got shit in writing and this way you do what you say, that's one. Uh, right, which gives you the ability to do this thing, which is to, uh, coordinate a shared social space at a distance. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the that's the tricky business. So it's just kind of to take that old go past. Let's flash forward to mm, let's go like 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Okay. And then jump to the 1920s. Like 1950 okay. this is this is a proposition that I've made fundamentally and Actually, I want to just sort of sh oh go ahead. Actually, if we pause on that, let's go back to when you first landed on, oh, okay, when we have this grammar proposition, you said two things super crucial. One, you said I could lie, okay? And then you also then said, look at how well we can cooperate, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and this was a very big part of the insight is that what I called the tipping points called the problem of justification in justification systems theory. So once we get propositions and questions, we get question answer dialogue, okay? You have the truth proposition of it, is it valid? And then you have the value propositions of it. If it's coming from me, it's in my interest. And then how does it fit in the social group interest value? Yep. Okay. So these are the intersections that all of a sudden this proposition, which is legitimizing an is ought claim by definition, because I'm making an is claim, even if it's the antelope over there, why am I talking about this instead of the rabbits over there? Yep. Right? So I'm making a value claim, even just the fact of it. Injustification means that we're spending time with it and it has the potential to bring our attention and therefore influence both of us. Okay? 
which means then the network of interests is complicated. Okay. The reason it's complicated because my interests and your interests are not going to be identical. All right. And this truth and proposition thing can be, well, as we know, <laughs> it's complicated what's true. <laughs> okay. So we can think about it in simple terms like, oh, it's true oh, that the antelope well, over there. Okay. It's, it's, uh, I want to, I want to kind of double down. It's, it's complicated per se, like that the concept of complicatedness mm -hmm. is found in this, like first and foremost in this move. And let me say that a, a slightly different way. Um, every word and every sentence is by definition, no, is for sure a massive reduction of the complexity of the reality that it is happening in, right? That is complicatedness. There we go. We're done. That's complicatedness. Boom. Right. Um, and so the, the, the ability to uh, engage in this sort of elision or compression um, and, well, hold on. So it has to do with compression and it has to do with, what's that word, like digitization, a quantitization of complex reality. Uh, is first is like that's that's like a, a fundamental piece of the move, and of course now this gives rise to the ability and also the necessity and the efficiency of constructing uh, social relationships out of these same kind of complicated building blocks. Okay? And and of course, um, as soon as you begin to move out of the your oral distance socially, Dunbar spatially, yeah. right? Just uh, how far along the uh, telephone game you can play before mm -hmm. it no longer is providing coordinating power. Yep. You begin to be forced. This is, a, I think, a key piece of the game A insight is that um, you, you can only, or so far at least, we can only construct um, coordinating structures at spatial and population, and by the way, and temporal scale mm -hmm. um, out of, complicated building blocks. Yep. So I can move from a, hmm, I wish it'd be, <laughs> it'd be very powerful to be able to actually move back into a, uh, an oral indigenous consciousness to yes. be able to really get a felt sense of what it's like to utter. But my sense is that, that the utterances will be very in the present. And, and yes, definitely evidence in that. And the, the kind of abstraction they engage in is different than mo, you know, traditional, formal, modern people get taught a particular kind of abstraction through writing and mm -hmm. logic that is actually quite different. They, they'll think much more embeddedness in terms of experience. Like they, if you give them a syllogism, they're like, you know, all bears are white. <laughs> There's a bear, what colors is it? I don't know, I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Actually, they will. There's good evidence that would be like, even these are wise elders, but they will not engage in the same kind of um, sort of analytic formal logic abstraction yeah. uh, that, that emerges. And I wanna, I wanna be very careful to make sure that, because that, there's a little bit of a slippage there. What, what I'm talking about when I just, just now is using the phrase oral indigenous is I'm actually talking about the, uh, the pre 150,000 year ago mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. use of language oh, okay. And, okay. and the post. Which okay. is to say that there's like there's two major distinctions. One one distinction is that, right. Then the second distinction is the distinction between I guess what would probably be properly be referred to as the oral indigenous, and the uh, literate or the the written, okay. uh, mm -hmm. kind of mind um, that happened afterwards. And as you're right. saying, this there is in fact very distinct kinds of inferences and modes of abstraction that do and don't happen between those kind the kinds of minds that happened after. The yep. systems of justification kicked off and clearly before. Totally. All right. Whew. Let's see. So let me click on one other piece and then as you metabolize that. Okay. Yep. Because because so this is the context. So your context of vision, as given where you're situated in your life history, is like you're a systems man. You see all of these different systems that are operating. That's where you got positioned, okay? I'm positioned in the clinic room, okay? 
So people come to me mm. with their problems, mm. right? You know, and I say, hey, what brings you in today? And they tell me, and then I get to know them. And then I layer back what their conscious awareness of, and then what they're not really conscious of, and then what they sink into their heart after I get to know their story, right? And so one of the things you notice as a clinician is that people struggle enormously how to be honest with themselves, okay? And know what to tell other people and how to tell it to other people what they are, okay? So for example, like the imposter syndrome. I think hmm. other people like me, okay? But they don't really know me. And if I were to tell them what I really was, oh my God, I'm not sure, mm. all right? And then how do, how do I deal with that? Should they love me anyway? Or should I fake it? Or what am I? Okay. And relative to what I present and relative to the effects that I have on other people. So this uh, Carl Rogers and Sigmund Freud, both in their own way, were very, very clear that our self-conscious system relative to our animalistic non-verbal system and relative to the social world and judgment was an unbelievably complex matrix for us humans to navigate. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I would put out there, and I'm not sure if this is, if this is right, but I would put out there something like, and right now broken. Right? The, oh. the thing that emerged in this timeline, the systems of justification hasn't settled into something that has um, uh, continuity. It doesn't have, it hasn't settled to something that is actually stable. Um, and so there's a, you know, there's a bit of a dice throw or a bit of a, uh, well, by the way, I guess it's better, a bit of a, hmm, I wonder if this is gonna work out kind of a situation here. Uh, and more, 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 much more so than is the ordinary characteristic of living things. Like obviously living things have a contingency having to do with things like niches change and you know, shit goes wrong. This is more about, is this a viable niche at all? Like, is yep. it just a, 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 a thing that's going to burn out in a finite time under all possible scenarios? Yep. The reason why what came to my mind, there was something along the lines of, I was inquiring into the, <laughs> into the system essence of imposter syndrome. And, and the reason why that can happen, I would propose, is that um, our, our sort of a fundamental, our basic humanness is presumes a context where there's a very, very tight loop connection between the way I'm showing up and the feedback of the people around me, both in terms of, of, of uh, speed and in terms of duration. And in terms of novelty, which is a almost no novelty, right? More or less, I know everybody who I've ever met, I've known my entire life and vice versa. And therefore, the, the, the space that can emerge in this notion that there's a gap between my identity and myself is effectively zero, right? A very, very small amount. You know, I can sort of, I can ooh, pretend that I'm a really big man. Everybody knows who I am better than I do. So nobody's going to be fooled. Um, when you when you step into this new space, right, this social space, this space that is enabled by and governed by complicatedness, um, then of course that gap begins to become possible. I, I'm encountering people who may never meet me again. I'm oftentimes encountering people who don't know me well. And in fact, in the contemporary environment, I almost never encounter anybody who does know me well. <laughs> it's almost the exact inverse. <laughs> um, and so first, I've begun to become more and more uh, mapping or, or trapped in the notion that my identity, which is to say the, the, the aspect of self that is the social, socially legible construct, yep. is more real than myself. And that's one big problem, as, as I've, we've talked about in the past. Um, and and I mean, by, what I mean by that is that that's the currency that actually is governing most of the relationships that I'm actually finding myself in. Uh, and then also, of course, in that space between the two, I've got all this weird stuff going on, all these different possibilities of, okay, well, what am I, what am I supposed to be even doing here? Like inauthenticity and authenticity <clears throat> get very confused. I notice, for example, that if I act inauthentically, I can generate what appears to be successful dynamics in the relational space. And in fact, quite, quite even more intensely, to act authentically almost always results in negative implications in social space. 
And by the way, if I start running the evolutionary dynamic of the niche of what that looks like, <clears throat> the more and more down the road we get, which is to say, the more we're, you know, how many generations are we into social space? A thousand, 3,000 generations down the road, social space itself begins to be um, seeking and creating niches for what inauthent artful inauthenticity must look like. I mean, you might even say that school is, is sort of teaches nothing but artful inauthenticity. <laughs> that is the beginning and the end of the content of formal schooling. Um, and by the way, while we're at it, the entire media landscape, I mean, just think about the, the essence of the media landscape is that you are giving attention right to that primate, that deep pre-linguistic primate is like, well, whatever the fuck I'm attending must be important. I'm giving deep, deep attention as does everybody else who I know. I remember actually being a kid, like in second grade, watching these two kids playing with little race cars and they were uttering a series of utterances that I didn't understand, but they clearly understood. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? What's happening? As it turns out, they were simulating the Dukes of Hazard. Ah. So I started watching TV. Prior to that, never really watched that much TV. Watched Little Sesame Street, Little Electro Company, but not like that. Which, by the way, I watched a lot of TV after that, dude. I right. became as much of a right. TV imbiber as anybody. <clears throat> and so we're now collectively and individually giving our attention to this thing which is simultaneously super salient, right? Designed to be maximally super salient and <laughs> is fundamentally characterized by the fact that there was a complete disconnect between the self and the identity, right? The guy who played Luke Duke wasn't Luke, wasn't a Duke, right? If at all, it's Tom Wopad, where the fuck his name was. And I have no idea who that is, right? So just think about that as like a basic fundamental sensibility of that of the gap and the gradient of the, at least the, the sense of the ability to achieve success. And then here's the big kind of the payload at the end of it. I'll do it from my side because, you know, I might as well, might as well sort of partition things right. right. The, the fact that, I mean, can propose it, the fact that um, an infinite amount of success in society is zero, right? That's, that's the proposition. This is the Ozymandias protocol, right? No matter how awesome your civilization was, it's dust, right? It's vapor. It means nothing. Um, and if you try to seek immortality by inscribing your identity deeply into the uh, mythology of your civilization, and therefore, by the way, at the very least, endeavor to make your civilization super double plus awesome, you've wasted your fucking time. Um, although you may believe, you may fool yourself into believing you're some, doing something awesome. And even worse, many, many generations afterwards might ape you as well. Hence yep. King, right? Hence Kaiser. Um, and yet it's all dust in the wind. So that's from the outside, right? That's from the yep. big picture. Obviously from the inside, you know, all the psychologists for as long as we've been doing psychology keep pointing to the fact that, you know, it kind of feels really uncomfortable. You feel like it's no good. I had a, a guy, who was it? Sid. Uh, Sid, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I had a conversation with him in the past month or so. And mm -hmm. it's awesome. Like really insightful. Mm -hmm. um, and he was talking about, oh, Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. So apparently I say some, I talk smack about Elon Musk. Okay. Um, and, I, and I suppose that's probably true, which is to say exactly what I'm just saying. Like on the one hand, from the point of view of um, an identity construct that is a techno entrepreneur, maybe the best that ever has been, mm. right? Maybe even better than the ones we make up, like maybe mm. actually better than Tony Stark. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And in, in many ways, by the way, also seems pretty cool. Like not even, doesn't even seem like an asset. Like it's a lot of high quality identity structure there. Mm -hmm. But the proposition is, and I don't, I don't know, by the way, from the inside, that that's not where meaning is found. Right? Think, think about what are his relationships with his kids? What's his relationship with his friends and family? Like what's, to what degree is his soul being nurtured? Because right. that's the stuff that is actually meaningful. And so, you know, Sid mentioned that some of his friends and sort of people around him are like, oh, why is he talking smack about Elon Musk? The guy's a, mm -hmm. you know, the guy's a, a winner with a capital W. Mm -hmm. And then he quoted, he, was, he, he, he himself was like, what's going on here? And he remembered another guy, Steve Jobs, who we have this really useful anthropological point that Steve Jobs is dead. Yep. And Steve Jobs died of a, of a, of a not an instantaneous death. Right? So there was a period of time where he was quite clear that he was going to die, yep. um, but also had the ability of being conscious and aware of it. And apparently, yep. I think maybe his daughter, 
uh, wrote yep. a biography. And in the biography, she, un, uh, she reveals mm -hmm. the painful reality yep. that in the last days and months of his life, mm -hmm. he more or less recanted of all of his Ozymandias grandeur. Yep. It was like, to have not been a good father was as much agony and grief as one could imagine. And I very much can't imagine it. And to have been the guy who created the iPhone was meaningless. Yeah. That's right. Uh, as I trace this from a clinical perspective, uh, I start because I'm in the evolutionary world. I'm like, oh, we want social influence. And I've already told you a little bit about this, but it's coming out from just a different angle. So we're motivated towards social influence. That's the ability to get me to move you in accordance with my interests. Mm -hmm. Very instrumental, basic. And to the extent that I can move others, my survival and reproductive success, great. Okay. So we're going to track instrumental influence as a barometer. And I'm going to be, when I get to do it, hey, that's great. When I can't do it, I'm going to notice that that's not great. So we're motivated to acquire social influence as a resource. That was the, that's the baseline. But then what I noticed in the clinical room is, oh my God, people have influence, but they're imposters. Okay. Actually, the first thing I noticed, because I work with people who had no influence, people lived under bridges who were homeless and I worked mm. with them. Okay. <laughs> if you have no influence, you have been abused your whole life and you live on the outskirts as a drug addict underneath a bridge, it sucks. That sucks. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody cares if you die. That mm. sucks. Okay. So that's what first caught my attention, right? No influence. That terrifies us all. Oh my God, I'll be ignored. I'll be rejected. You get kicked out into the darkness and the monsters eat you. And that's a nightmare. Okay. So influence matters and that's instrumental. Right. Mm. But then you realize once you get influence, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'd have influence, but they may not value me. Like I may be their boss and I can control them, but they don't like me. Okay. So then it's like, am I valued and have I influenced? That's the second layer can be a valued influence. And then it was like, oh my God, sometimes I'm valued and I have influence, but they don't know me because of the imposter. Okay. So this, the robust soul has influence, is valued, and is known at its core. Okay. That's, and because we can fake it and because we can fucking lie for our influence, <laughs> we're in this conundrum, right? <laughs> do we lie for our influence or do we be authentic or what do we do in relation? The oral indigenous system had to deal with this, but man, was it set up for all the reasons you mentioned, you got overtime connections with kin. So it's like, yeah, you'll bullshit some, but you'll be called out, you'll get to known and you will settle. So you don't have to, the structures of your public identity, your private narrator and your primate soul, well, that's gonna be okay. The modern system, holy shit, have we created all sorts of opportunities for that thing to fracture. Right, so let me, let me kind of, let me turn the clock 66 degrees and move from opportunities to necessities. And this is that same story that I was telling last time, but it feels like retelling it briefly now is useful. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got a question. One question is, okay, what's the moment? What's like the pop that emerges this new game? It almost feels like a symmetry break in, mm -hmm. the, in the classic physics sense. Mm -hmm. um, huh. And then, and, and then the next, the next thing that happens is then you have the, the shift in the, in the environment, in the context, whereby the expansion of game A mm -hmm. begins to become dialed in, locked in. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it, it, it has gotten to the point where um, at a minimum, no thing indigenous oral can stand before it. All right? that's, that's kind of the key threshold. Yep. You've got the periodic emergence and eruption of it. Mm -hmm. It's probably happened over thousands or tens of thousands of years. Yep. And then you had some point at which it achieved a level of capacity. And I imagine, by the way, this is strictly technological and psychotechnological mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that no thing oral indigenous could stand before it. Right now, of course, at this point, the game changes really, really radically. It's no longer opportunity, it's necessity. And if you are on the borders of the 
uh, Syrians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you are oral indigenous, um, you are just going to be consumed. That's all there is to it, right? The machinery of civilization, the machinery of that, of the industrial societal material complex, right? And it's distribution of skill, of technological wealth. It just is, it's a, it's an influence machine. It's an influence machine. Yeah. Yeah. Hold that. There's something really powerful there. I like that way of actually looking at it from the inside out, an influence machine. Yeah. What does it mean to be consumed? What does it actually mean to be consumed by, by empire? Um, well, you it either means... submit or die. It's the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and submit is submit. Right? But the key thing, when you say submit, what the key thing is that you must now make your choices on the basis of the, con the context of this game. That's it. That's the key thing, right? And the, and the essence of it, of course, is the just that little tipping point is the bias towards the complicated, the bias towards the social, the bias towards identity, playing in the context of whatever the complicated system happens to be. Like that's the, the to submit is yep. to play according to those rules as right. your most fundamental basis. Like if you can carve out a little space, you know, in, inside your family abode, you can maybe play it slightly differently. Of course, it gets harder and harder to do that because you lose more and more track of who you are. Um, but the, the number one has to be playing according to those rules. And as I, as I just sort of said, but I'll say it again, um, it becomes relatively straightforward <laughs> that if you really play according to those rules, you end up being the aristocrat and if you play mediocre according to those rules, you probably end up being a slave. Right? So mm. it, it's not too long to realize that um, unless you've got some very, very deep commitment that holds you in a very intense way against that pull, mm -hmm. um, the sort of entropy, the corrosion, the corruption that sets in, it continues to just kind of break down the sort of the right. oral indigenous substrate, things like self and yep. family and Dunbar and mm -hmm. more and more pulls everything right. out. So this is when the complicated society sort of grows and encircles the complex adaptive dynamic culture. It just, shoo. yeah. And now you're plugged in and you're in the bubble, you know, and maybe you have your complex adaptive dynamic relations inside the bubble, but the bubble now is, I mean, the bubble's just moving. Yeah, it's it's just a stronger uh, a, a stronger field, and and so it 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 overcodes. It's the language that Deloitte uses. It overcodes yep. the the deeper one. Now, about the deeper field, the oral indigenous or the the indigenous naturalness of humanus is, is is deeper, right? So wow, it's sort of like right, a more, mm -hmm. it's actually a bigger sphere, but it's not as intense within this particular domain. So, for example, this is one of the failure conditions that is implicit in all complicated systems, all civilization structures contain within themselves the seeds of their own destruction because as right. soon as the field of the civilization structure tips below a certain threshold um you know more indigenous dunbar level groups tribes inside of it will begin to squabble between each other and yep. it you know and then and that creates an accelerating dynamic right so if it we diagnose right it's got to have the constraints and the investment energy system is is the primate i mean the system <laughs> you know and it, and it will have constraints in relation Okay, cool. So, so let me, let's do this back yep. and forth. Cause I think if we do it in, based on our sort of a history and our skill set, something cool will emerge. So outside in, yep. um, the principle is the principle of the non sublative ontology, right? So a sublative ontology is when the outside, the, the largest uh, construct mm -hmm. has a identity itself mm -hmm. and everything on its interior, everything that's smaller in scale or, or comprehensivity is first and foremost subordinated to that larger thing, empire. Okay. Right? Okay. So if I think about myself and I have like in my, in my, in my persona, some aspect of myself presents itself as being who I am and every other aspect of myself must subordinate itself to that, right? right. The tyranny okay. of self on self, mm -hmm. tyranny per se, right? Sublata. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I may be using the wrong term, by the way, <laughs> which I like, by the way, if you, if it sounds like I'm wrong, ask Benita Roy, it's her term or probably not her term, but she's the one who gave it to me. And I, I always lose it because it's my ability to use complicated words is, is rapidly eroding. 
<laughs> you get the idea, right? The right, fundamental right, concept right. lands. I, I'm totally with you. All right, At so then levels. the alternative <laughs> approach, the alternative approach is, is also something that we witness in reality all the time. And this is, this is two dancers. If I think about it in terms of our jazz band versus a symphony. So let's just use that as a simple metaphor. In a symphony, the written music is imperial in nature. Right? Okay. It is what is. My role as a musician is to play the role that is, is given to me in this gotcha. construct. It is the, the outside, the symphony that holds the symphonic playing is mm -hmm. more fundamental, more real, and fully subordinates all the actions of the, of the players. Gotcha. In a jazz band, there is a whole, right? There's something that's going on that is larger than the individual players, but it does not have that kind of um, top-down constraint. Right? Yep. There is top-down constraint. That's why that we can talk about it as having a whole, but it doesn't constrain the players so fundamentally. Right? There's something, totally. it doesn't have the capacity to reach an identity that has a strength to it that pops and has this, mm, and everything inside is now a subordinate structure. Right. Okay. I'm going to call that a mesh work for now. It's I'm just okay. tagging it. And if you're DeLon, the guy, I may be using it wrongly vis-a-vis -vis the way he uses it. So just, mm -hmm. I'm just going to use that as a placeholder. Okay. But I'm with you. the thing, game B, the, on, the only valid approach that we have is to figure out how to construct something where the highest level, the most comprehensive level of abstraction doesn't become this, what I'm calling sublative and I kind of feel like I want to go okay. research it. So I've just got the right word, but that larger subordinating function. And so right. we, whatever wait, the large, wait. whatever the biggest thing is, it must be an emergent property that consistently only is as a consequence of renewal of emergence moment to moment. Okay. When you uh, expressed your concern about an ethical code, you are expressing, no, don't do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Just, just follow. Yeah. And this has to do with things like, you know, it can be named, it can be inscribed, it can mm -hmm. be written. It exists in the, in the abstraction layer. Like that makes the abstraction more real than right. the thing that is being abstracted. You know, you invest right. in the abstraction, the abstraction now becomes real. Hammurabi's code becomes yep. more important than the actual underlying justice right. and livingness in the event. And yep. all of that, every single version of that is, on the side of no, that's not a good way. That won't totally. ultimately won't last. It'll end up being a bad idea down the road. So me and Greg Thomas were with John Verveke and Steve uh, McIntosh yesterday at the Stoa. Uh huh. Okay, so that was our, and it was on values emergence. And John was going. John was in his uh, value emergence frame, and he was talking about how he's trying to embody this, to hold it in relationship to the propositional, but he embody it in the procedural and most notably perspectival participatory es essence of being so that we are, we're in the agent arena environment as it emerges in whatever organic dynamic capacity that allows it to thrive based on whatever principles, you know, are wise. And that whole question about what are limit of load stars for wisdom, but what will not constrain that which would be possible in some unforeseen foreseeable future. Oof. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to throw a few more things out. And I, and I, at some point I want to see if there's a way to flip it and go from the inside out for some more okay. things from the outside in. So Benita talks about um, in the, in the, in the, the, the tool that she built collective insight practice, mm -hmm. she talks about the, the experience and, and also by the way, the, the necessity that when people enter into this practice, they simultaneously have a, have a sense of there being a, a shared perspective, but more fundamentally, a diversity or a singularity of individual perspectives. And so for what happens is you come together, mm -hmm. you kind of meld, something generative comes out of it. You can kind of all say, yeah, that was shared, mm -hmm. but there's no intent or desire like that. to have that sharedness live beyond the actual gathering. <laughs> but the change in yourself, right? The consequences of the experience and the consequences of the sharedness that lives on in yourself does live beyond it. And you carry that yep. back out into the world. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's like, hmm, God, how does that work? And the, and the, and the question I'm looking at is, well, I know the languaging for it. So it's, we're talking about the distinction between coordination and coherence. Yep. 
uh, Yasuhiko Komura named the distinction between alignment, sorry, agreement and alignment. Right. Okay. So if you and I agree, we have something like a superficial um, willingness to say yes to the same set of propositions. Yeah. Okay. Is that an antelope? Yes, that's an antelope. We agree. Mm -hmm. Alignment has to do with something like the degree to which uh, our values orient us such that over, over time, short, medium, and long term, our actions will tend to support each other. Yes. And so we, we, will, okay. we will, whether we meet each other or not, like this is one of the powerful things, like it's a, you know, this mm -hmm. sort of implicit conspiracy. Whether I meet mm -hmm. someone or not, if we are aligned, the way we are participating in the world will tend to support the emergence of something that we both value highly. Beautiful. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the, at a, so here's me and my psychological kind of frame on this. Okay. Is and this is goes right to some of the elegance of oral indigenous is that they find ways to maximize simultaneously agency and communion. Okay. Yes. When they're often put as polar opposites, are you with the group or are you a hyper individual? There's actually spaces that allow both the individuated agent and the communal mutuality to be enhanced. And those spaces, there are lots of good reasons to believe that that for the soul is optimal. Yeah, and I think that almost in, in sort of immediately when you have this partitioning between society and, I don't know, I'm just gonna call it community, but again, the words here get really challenging. And as you said, identity and soul, that's much, much easier, I think stronger. You can begin to say, oh, well, this dichotomy between agency and communion just lives actually in the complicated structure of society. It lives actually just in the complicated structure of identity. It's not present at all in the complex reality of soul in the complex reality of community. It isn't a, it's not even a problem if you actually, so if you can get over here, that dichotomy becomes not real because the dichotomy is simply implicit in the axiomatics of the complicated. So of course it's challenging, right? You're stuck. If you're in the axiomatics of the complicated, if you're living in the complicated, then it is a real dichotomy. And it's in fact, irreducible. You can't escape, no matter how hard you try to escape it, you can't. You'll simply be reinstantiating it. And anytime that you instantiate the complicated, you'll be bringing it back in, in some new form. So you're able to be confused about its presence until it rears its ugly head again. But to avoid it, you simply move to this other mode. And in this other mode, it's not even a problem at all. It's not even a, a valid statement, it's nonsense. So what does that look like? Like, how, do, how does it feel maybe to be living? And, and I guess in some sense, again, it's, it's not hard. It's easy in the small, right? And so if we, if we return back to our indigenous baseline, you know, if you happen to have been lucky enough to have gotten through the catastrophe of being a human in civilization to the point where you can actually have friends, and I mean that like with capital F, like real friends, real friends, um, then you will notice that it is exactly what we're describing, right? Real friendship is precisely this location in relationality where we and I are somehow deeply intrinsically commingled. Right? It's only really by being fully who you are, like to mm -hmm. dig deeper and deeper into yourself and to bring it more and more into the relationship that true mm -hmm. friendship is at all. Mm -hmm. And what you discover is that the power, almost like the essence of the, of the nature of true friendship is me bringing the whole of myself in relationship with you bringing the whole of yourself. And there's right. something about that that enriches and neutrifies ourselves. Yep. And that then creates a bond, a relationship that is strong, not merely useful, not merely contingent. Yes, right. It's got relational value. We're known and valued in addition you know, which becomes central than instrumental. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got your, your beautiful and deeply painful story of the, you know, the homeless drug addict living under the bridge and nobody cares if you die, which is sort of the, the, the contemporary equivalent of the, the, the former um, indigenous person enslaved and perhaps thrown to the, to the, to the, to the lions. 
Yeah. And has also an, uh, an artifact of the notion of the scapegoat. And here I mean the person who's kicked out of the tribe, you know, thrown into the desert, mm -hmm. which is the, the reality of the, um, if you fail in the influence game, like truly failing in the influence game is in a deep sense, I'm not sure if it's more fundamental, but it's sure fucking important. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's it's I mean, hard you don't to get really... Maslow. You know, I work with people that I didn't have Maslow's base. You know, your biological needs of safety and food, and uh, you know everything else draws on that. And it's yeah, no, it, that, that you need that. Definitely. Yeah, and, and, and as you said, it's actually it seems to me quite quite right. Hmm. Okay, that this is there's a complicated there's a complexity here around things how things wind around each other, but it's something like. If you begin, literally, like if you are born into a context where your individual and probably your group's collective capacity to pr produce influence is already very contingent. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, you know, a dysfunctional alcoholic family with very yep. limited capacity to produce resources or at least to hold integrity, then your trajectory as a child and an adult is kind of deeply fucked from the so get-go. So that's one big part of it. The second is, um, and that's that's documented by the way. It's called an insecure attachment, and it influences the entire structure of your socio-emotional primate system. So if you're born into that, I mean, it's not it's not like you write on law, but dispositionally, <laughs> you get insecure attachment. It's a very very foundational uh, set of insights, which means you're constantly yeah. defended, and then you will constantly project defense, a defensive identity, out here to avoid additional injury and you'll create a split between a defensive projected identity self and the feared self because the dangers are out here mm -hmm. and you're constantly adjusting according to living in a defended insecure attached place and we can see this in very easy in infants and, and you're, you'll be playing the influence game now to the degree to which you can at all within okay. the constraints of that like that's actually more fundamental it trumps it a bit. Fuck, if you can't, you have to have control over your safety. That's the first and foremost. Get that at least and get a little bit of influence and then you get known and valued. It's Maslow's hierarchy. You get esteem and uh, belonging come at, after influence of the environment and a capacity to move people around hmm. your safety. I mean, that's, that's yeah, so it's, you know, if you look at the, at the institutions of human development that we have, particularly in the West, which I have much more familiarity with. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> if they were designed to produce insecure attachment, they could hardly do a better job than they do. Right. So I do not know the degree to which it's merely the consequence of uh, the construct of life, uh, or there's actually a malevolent intent to really fuck things up. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're challenge like our, our 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 ability to produce secure attachment is really really challenged um and so it's just like this i'm gonna say beautiful this sort of what's the right word john we get right the right word like this awful uh linkage this sort of synergistic feedback loop between the degree to which i obligate must subordinate self and play the influence game, the society influence game, to feel that I have any control, and in fact, probabilistically to in fact have any control, um, by implication provides a developmental environment for my relationships, particularly for the relationships over which I have the most responsibility of care mm -hmm. that produces things like insecure attachment. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, just case in point, we can phone Zach Stein on this, and I think he'll confirm. Yeah, <laughs> <It'd be funny. laughs> confirmed. Click. I think yeah. our developmental educational psychologist would say, actually, it is good to have real connection and mentorship along over time, rather than judge people as adequate or not uh, relative oh. to the mass they put on. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I'm going to put this. Oh God! All right, so I'm going to put this out there because I believe it's super strong, and I know this is going to trigger a lot of people because. No, but here, no judgment. I'm, I'm not. I'm not um, trying to make people feel bad in a asymmetric sense. I'm trying to collectively get to the point where, I'm like, okay, shit, how do we begin to take more responsibility and in alignment begin to make choices as individuals to begin the process of moving this thing 
consistently and progressively in a positive direction. Or to put it another way, I deeply care about the people you love most. Right. So what I'm about. So for example, the modern construct, the modern environment in, in America, which started in the 70s, where more and more and more um, parents worked and children are raised by institutions. Totally. All right. That's insecure attachment. That's, a, that's an insecure attachment machine of like that you couldn't dream to envision if you, if you did your best. Right? The, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, my oldest daughter, um, I was a tech entrepreneur mm -hmm. starting tech companies, which is an you know, mm -hmm. intense and fully consuming thing. Yep. And my wife at the time was an MD, PhD. Mm. Also, you know, MD isn't hard enough. Let's add a PhD on top of it. <laughs> and we had kids. I'm feeling inadequate. I only have a PhD. Oh, yeah, you should. That's the point of it, right? <laughs> it's the whole point of the MD, PhD is to make you feel Swift. inadequate. <laughs> By the way, I, just so you know, the only appropriate way to refer to an MD, PhD is doctor, doctor. Ah, if right. you merely call them a doctor, that's a deep insult to their, <laughs> to their influence. Um, so my oldest daughter, who's 18 now, um, at like two, is raised, you know, put, dropped off at, at, at daycare. And at three, is dropped off at preschool. And, you know, dot, 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 until, you know, here we are in high school. You know, that's, that's it. That's reality. And I remember as the parent who did a lot of that dropping off, she didn't like that. And her little indigenous body knew that was fucked up beyond comprehension. And her ability to trust the human beings with whom, for whom she had the highest degree of trust was shattered every single time. And, you know, and then her little psychology was doing its best to figure out how she creates stability. And what do we do? Every year it changes. So even as she begins to build attachment to one group of adults and or kids, it changes. So it's a new set of relationships and a new set of relationships. And each one of which, oh my God, dude, it's brutal. Like, oh, and I mean, this is my first person experience. I'm telling you right now. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, my friend Darsha Narva is a professor who studies indigenous cultures and developmental things, talks about the evolved nest. And so she looks at what's the context in which we were born, I mean, evolved to be born into, and what is the context of what we're doing now? And she literally will say, we're half human as a function of what we do to our... Oh, and the half of us that is human is just coarse with pain and grief and <laughs> sadness. That's, we're, that's it's cool. almost like a, a torture chamber. Like the half of us that is functional is robotic. Right, we left the good half back there and then we jam the other half into our social identities that we try to it's, navigate the world through. I, the visual image I have is the, is, is the Borg. You mentioned it, but it is the Borg, right? You've got this body and it's raised in a machine and it's driven by a machine. Like it's the Borg, all right? So that's, that's what I'm proposing we give up. And I'm proposing we give up the Borg. And I don't know exactly what it looks like, A, to get us over the hump. So, so let me side the other side, by the way. Some people have mentioned this in, in other conversations. So um, it's not clear to me for sure whether or not game A is full stop, just a bad thing. Hmm. Like if it was just a fucking mistake that took us off on a 30,000 year um, arc of misery and death, right. or whether it was in fact a deeply, deeply meaningful and important and, and painful birthing process of something. I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, I obviously kind of hope it's the latter yeah, for lots of reasons, not the least of which is that if it's the former, then about 7 billion people are going to die in the next couple of decades. Yeah. No, there's lots of reasons to hope it's the latter. I'll put my <laughs> little, <laughs> I'll fill in my bubble on the latter. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for that. <laughs> Maybe um, it's naive, but I, I, I think but I'm I not, just, I think I can justify it. <laughs> I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but no. what, what, what I can say is, um, if it is the latter, and this is obviously the whole bet by proposing the concept of game B, right? right? Not, not the let's return back and maybe you get to be one of the, you know, tiny fraction that continue to live, but okay. What's this other thing look like? 
Um, how, what's that other side? How do we get to the other side of that? Oh. And there's a positive and a negative aspect to it. Right? The negative aspect we've stated a few times. How, how do we construct something that hermetically seals the series of air conditions that get us off, off track, right? They get us into this place of uh, identity versus self. They get us into this place of coordination versus coherence, agreement versus alignment, um, subordination to some kind of abstract formal construct, uh, as opposed to having those kinds of things intrinsically and only act as emergent properties that support the ongoing development and thrivingness of the individuals and families and groups and communities that are livingness in the interior of that. Um, and Actually, let me let me double ahead. click on that because just if you're if anybody's watching that, I thought you just that's just a brilliant summary. And I can say as a psychologist, I think Zach Stein could say, I think John Verbeke can say, it's like, yeah, <laughs> like that's the right design. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. As a psychologist, yeah. As a psychologist, I can say, as somebody who's surveyed a hell of a lot clinically, I have friends in developmental and cognitive psych, and it's known now. Like, like we can actually be like, yeah, no, our natures, our developmental histories, there are trajectories that make us whole, and there are trajectories that make us half human. We actually like know that. Mm, yeah. Okay. So let me let me then do the, the piece that I would bring onto this, and then put up the third point. So here's another thing we know. The other thing we know is that when it comes to creative collaboration in groups, when it comes to the substrate that generates innovation, when it comes to the way that we form the kinds of collective intelligence that can most fully and successfully search the space of the adjacent possible, mm. that is also yes. Huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> so as it, it turns it, it out, scales up. <laughs> it, the ingredients that give rise to the most wholeness and meaningfulness and fulfillment and well-being in individuals, and the ingredients that give rise to the most capable creative collaborations in groups, are the same. All right. Now that's good news. That is good news. The, the, the third point on this tripod has to do with the, the challenge space, I would say. Mm. And in the challenge space, and, and I'm saying it from the point of view of innovation, and there probably are many others, which is we're right at a threshold. This is another one of the, I think you and I both coordinate on this, but one of the, you know, the things that is, <laughs> frankly, why I'm talking publicly instead of just hanging out. Uh, we're right at the threshold of the the, our adjacent possible, our technological capacity as a species of a massive explosion in the ways that we are going to kill ourselves. Yep. This is a, the, sort of a key thing. This again, it was something that I was like, wow, you know, what was, I think it was like 10 or 15 years ago, just looking at the, at the, at the arc of the technologies that were clearly come down the line and going, oh shit, you know, 1945, we woke up to the reality that suddenly we had this capacity we'd never had before of actually extinguishing ourselves. And that was a hard thing for us to get past and probably has constrained most of geopolitics and a sizable chunk of society since then. Yep. If you just think about the consequences, the downward facing consequences of running up against that threshold. Mm -hmm. But we've been exploring the interior of that box, right? The box bounded by mutually assured destruction. Since then, you know, we've been yep. inventing things like psyop, different ways to wage war against each other without blowing everything up. Right. You know, fourth generation warfare, fifth generation warfare. How do we yep. continue to wage war without crossing the threshold into mad? Mm -hmm. um, and also economic, although, like I said, the military industrial mm -hmm. complex. So right. all the and technological, it, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's because you woke up that I woke up, by the way. So I woke up based on you and Daniel and because I come off of Jordan Peterson, actually. Ah, interesting. Okay. I'm stuck in the academy with my system, trying to bang on the door of the academy going, this is a much better system, guys. You guys are operating an old operating system. Okay. And then I try to tell the scientists, I try to tell the therapists, but the system doesn't jive with the zeitgeist of now the blue church of the academy. It just doesn't yep. for a yep. whole host of reasons. And then I'm getting frustrated. And actually, Jordan Peterson... I step off my directorship role. Jordan Peterson comes on. Donald Trump gets elected. And then I get into a huge fight with my program, which I don't need to go into here. But literally, I was my home. And all of a sudden, 
the, sh the, the real brief answer is I sat on the sidelines of the Jordan Peterson phenomenon and goes, man, we should look at that and study that. That's fascinating, right? Both about, he, I mean, he's the exact same training I do. So it's like, oh, isn't that really cool that the culture's reacting to him in a particular way? And we, of course, as doctoral level psychologists are mature enough to watch mm. that wake. Well, some people turn around, he's a transphobe and an evil person. And anybody that pays attention to him is that. And I'm like, <laughs> it's like, what kind of people are we training? Okay. So essentially, so then there's a wake and a wobble and a really serious, serious set of uh, conflicts about what was friendship and then what wasn't, and then what was this. Okay. And as I then searched, I got sucked into the wake of Jordan Peterson. And who did I find? <laughs> <laughs> but people telling me that the entire, not only just the psychic structure and the old getting atrophying inertia church, but Jesus were on a trail that is not sustainable. You right. Know? You know? So, and I went from my Steve Pinker, I think things are getting better enlightenment now to no, actually, this is very likely to be a tipping point. Okay. And looked at it myself, but was led by you because you had woken up. Daniel Schmuckenberger woke up, and then I made my own assessment. I was like, "Damn." Yeah. So, so in that context, anyway, the challenge sorry. the challenge that I'm looking at is <clears throat> we we have this possibility of constructing something that has as kind of its fitness function innovation. That's the thing that we can stake as a hopefulness that we can do that better, faster. We have, though, on the other side, the constraint that innovation brings in an increasing capacity to cause damage. And in fact, um, catast catastrophe. And we're right at the threshold of it. We're not talking about um, small. We're talking about almost all the thresholds of innovation that matter um, present increasingly narrow paths of avoiding catastrophe. That's what makes yeah. sense. <laughs> so the, 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 the eye of the needle that has to be threaded is how do we sort of unclench all of game A? This is what I've, I've called transition B, which is very poorly marketed. But how do we unclench game A, right? Which by itself is going, the cultural logic of game A is is an accelerating rocket straight into a wall. Mm -hmm. You cannot help but be that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But how do we do so in a fashion that doesn't have us just blowing us up too? Totally. Right. This is that's that's like there's the part right there. Um, it's it practically speaking, it looks a lot like stuff that we've seen in the past. I mean, practically speaking, it looks like slowing down enough to be careful with the things that you're doing. You know, the old medieval guilds, you know, the old medieval guilds acted as an actual, or you know, in the, indig in the indigenous context, or for that matter, the Amish, right? The Amish have a model that isn't technophobic, it's just techno careful. Mm. And they're like, well, I don't know exactly what the implications of TV are gonna be. Right. Let's say no until we've got more information. Or for that matter, I don't know exactly what the implications of mass mRNA vaccinations are going to be. I don't know. Just don't know, right? Uncertainty level, very high. Almost complete, actually. Mm -hmm. So maybe, perhaps, we should not go screaming willy-nilly down that path. Maybe there's a, an interesting alternative approach to uh, kind of a 50s era a radical, naive enthusiasm that all things produced by the miracles of chemistry shouldn't be consumed with maximum gluttony. Um, but we run into a problem, right? If you go a little bit slower than the guy next to you, then the guy next to you can extinguish you. That's right? the old game A problem. Um, so how exactly we navigate that with in the time that we have, which is not that long by my estimation, and with the deafness uh, that we need is a really interesting, tricky problem. Okay. Alignment, by the way, I think is one of the key insights here. Yep. Can we jump to that? I don't know if we yeah. can. It feels like this one's been pretty meandry, but let's, let's jump to that and see if it happens because the, the proposition of alignment in the context of where we've been so far. So here I invoke things like hyper-conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So if, if you are following the conversation that Greg and I have had, this video and the previous video, and frankly, if you want to just invoke all the conversations that Greg and I have had in a linear way, and if you're following that in a linear fashion, you're missing the point. Right? The proposition I would put out there is that we are participating in a hyper conversation. Mm -hmm. And a hyper conversation has at least two fundamental characteristics. One is that it's nonlinear in time, right? meaning that the fact that this particular video takes place ostensibly after our previous the conversation we had last week is not meaningful. Well, it's meaningful, but it's not obligate. Right? You can watch them in, in one order. You can watch them in another order. Um, but the temporal aspect is, is formally decoupled from the meaning of what is conveyed. Uh, and the second is that it's, uh, it's, it's decoupled in, I guess you would call it sort of like context. So ostensibly, Johnny V is not in this conversation, right? Ostensibly, there's a conversation that Johnny V is happening with Chris Meister Pietro that we are not participating in. I'm going to say, fuck that. I don't know what's going on. And if, if, if as a person, I happen to go and watch John and Chris have a conversation on YouTube, then I watch Greg and Jordan have a conversation. In my mind, those conversations are commingled. Right? So the objective aspect that tells me that there's something about them that has some a causal characteristic that I have to force them into a particular um, possible relationality, the notion of hyper-conversation is going to say, well, you know, maybe, yeah, sure. I mean, there's, there's something to that, but it's not the whole story. And what's more important is what actually happens, what actually occurs in the world. And this is that distinction between agreement and alignment, or at least it's related to it. Yeah. From the point of view of alignment, what, ha what matters is to what degree are the variety of experiences which is to say the expressions into the world generated by people that are then perceived by other people uh, collectively oriented by, so, so produced by or expressions of values, some set of values or perhaps values in general, just values in such a way that they shift, they reliably and consistently shift the expressions of people in alignment with or in furtherance of those values. Okay. What did I just say? I apologize. I, I don't know what I just said. Well, here's what I heard. Um, there is a network extending through time of exchanges that are creating cultural spaces that are affording relational exchanges, values, and real encounters that create a microcosm of the kind of transition that might enable the shift from the off the cliff system to a migration of a way of living that is far more ensouled and aligned mm. than the current structure. Hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. So the, <laughs> this is, this is the solution to the problem. The innovation that we're talking about is actually an innovation in religion space. It's not an invasion in material space. So the, it's a hyper justification relational dialogos. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Like it's easy. If you, if you think about it that way, it's not, you know, it's not trivial. It's not, oh, okay, done and done. But we're not trying. Game B is not trying to figure out how to do kinetic energy transformation of material phenomena better faster than game A. What we're trying to do is figure out how to get people across the threshold and up Maslow's hierarchy and in relationality of meaningfulness um, more cleanly with less noise, with less sort of uh, un unintended consequences and sort of reactions that generate consequences down the world. Like if you think about most of the bad things that actually happen in the world happen as a consequence of many of the stories that we were just telling, right? If you've got totally. weak attachment, then yep. also one of the things that happens is you tend to hurt other people. 
and in many cases, the ones you care about most. Yeah. I paired up with a guy for a while who coined the term emotional warfare, emotional warfare, and analyzed, and I think in a very compelling way, how very consistent with the influence matrix, we have a channel of the true self, and then, then we get in connection versus the defensive self. He called it the false self. The false self, then they get, and then it's the defense and the maintenance of influence that creates the defending barriers that then generates emotional warfare as you try to control your territory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And I, and I thought, and we talked a lot about, God, one of the great tragedies of the current culture is the amount of emotional warfare relative to what we could be living in, right? And the, essentially the alignment of soul and identity in relation, the true alignment rather than the defensive attacked alignment. And what we are saying, what you are saying to me, and I mean, I lose this as a psychologist, but it's the systems, of course, of societal, military, industrial complexes right, that are moving the externalized structure that drive the need for identity. And what we are saying is, can we open up this space and cultivate, you know, the true self connection. And find some way of creating an adequate context. I think this is also part of the, the real, um, <laughs> I'll say this a couple of different ways because I don't know quite how to say it well. I remember in the, in the context of the 2008 financial crisis, okay. uh, looking at it saying, yeah, this thing might blow up. Like, <laughs> it could be the end of the global financial system as we know it frankly, probably would have been better had it. I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? Just like for, for me or for the people who, who I, who sort of, I live near. Okay. And I read through my mind and said, well, let's just assume that we have a, a, an economic collapse of such enormous magnitude that it turns the clock back 30 years. Hmm. Let's make it 40 years. It's like, well, I don't recall 1968 being known as a Terrible time, right? So the the point being that something along the lines of um, I I don't know quite how far back we need to go in the technologies of extraction and exploitation to settle into something that is in fact actually stable, right? And I don't know quite how we migrate into more regenerative technologies that can support the human population at a very stable, but also high fulfillment level of well-being. Right. I know exactly what that is. Like all kinds of crazy ideas, but one of the things I've learned in the past five to seven years is to be really careful with a lot of the stuff that comes along with. It may seem like a really good idea, for example, to girdle the earth with low earth orbit satellites that produce um, internet connectivity for everybody. And that may actually be a really, really good idea, mm -hmm. but it may not be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's again, highly novel. We don't know exactly what the consequences it of that are. It opens up a be. lot of adjacent possible space when you do that. A lot of stuff happens there, exactly. So we don't, we don't know. Um, and frankly, we're gonna have to make some, uh, some bets. And we're gonna have to throw some dice at things and hope it works out. Uh, hopefully we can do a hell of a lot better job of being rational and reasonable than the folks who are governing us these days. Um, in those kinds of bets. But the point is something like, you know, if we look back to a place where a first person interview with a human and say, hey, what do you think about your quality of life right now? Mm -hmm. In terms of the material side. Mm -hmm. um, walking it back from 2021, mm -hmm. the short answer is there's a lot of stuff that we just flat out don't need. Like oh, that is that clearly is... not producing well-being. You know, this is that old homily that like, you know, the, what was the survey up to a certain amount of money, like 60000 or $80,000 in the United States in that year, mm -hmm. you saw a correlation with a, I'm happier or my well-being is going up. So below a certain number, you started seeing well-being go way down fast. Mm -hmm. And then above a certain number, nearly no positive correlation. And in fact, in some cases, negative correlation. Hmm. It, yeah, it flattens out the, the researcher in me will say, actually, that's a 
there's a lot of complicated angles on that. But well, whatever. I'm sure there is. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, my damn psychological scientist coming in. But well, and, and then I have I have this other really fun uh, research that was done by a guy named Joe Edelman, who I've mentioned I think a few times that mm -hmm. he was doing exercises where he was actually very fine grain, asking people questions about their felt sense of well-being, mm -hmm. and then he was inviting them into a you know ideation of what kinds of things might improve their well-being, mm -hmm. and then and then asking them again, like testing them again. Mm -hmm. And what he found was that, actually a couple of really interesting things. One was that people are almost universally terrible at yep. actually imagining what kinds of things would upgradient their well-being. Totally. Mm -hmm. And that there's a whole class of things that consistently upgradient well-being that have as a really interesting consequence, a almost complete removal from the GDP indexed economy. Mm -hmm. And so things like, uh, you know, getting together and having dinner in a group, yep. as opposed to going out to eat at a fancy restaurant, mm -hmm. um, almost always like going out dancing as opposed to going to a movie, just fill in the blank um, over and over and over again, <laughs> things that are oriented towards indigenous relationality uh, and away from super salient social constructs had the characteristic of actually producing higher levels of subjective well-being over, by the way, the short, medium, and long-term, like measured longitudinally, not just instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm just kind of trying to hammer on the same basic notion that- Same basic, right. Mm -hmm. The challenge is the challenge of how do we actually get our hand on the shoulder of the, the people who are enthralled to and in many ways in good faith enthralled to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the runaway constructs of war. Nice. Right? Yep. And how do we you know, say, hey, can we slow it down? Or is there a way for us to sort of innovate in the domain of peace? And I don't mean that hand wavy, I mean that like seriously. So as to actually generate active peace all over the place. And in, in particular, where the stakes are the highest. Yeah. We've got a lot of challenges, man. We've got to find a, a way of hermetically sealing against the various sort of stochastic error conditions between in the indigenous human base and the game A thre thresholds. We have to figure out how to step back from where we are now and do both of those things in a way that allows us to step into some new thing that is stable. But I have to tell you, at least we're having the conversation. You know, when I was yeah. having, when I was coming up to this, I was at sort of exactly this point from those, those three points 10 years ago mm. and not a lot of people to have conversations mm. with. Right. Now the conversation is starting to be had. So I'm really glad to be right. talking with you. Hey man, I'm very glad to be talking with you. I'm glad you woke me up. Hmm. <laughs> and, and I have some good news on the psychology side of this, mm. okay? which yes, it's a monster of a problem. The inertia that we face at the global level, oh my God, right? I mean, you know, but I really do believe a couple of very key points, okay? People are starting to get it and have really gotten it for a while that we could be doing this way better than we are at some level, like we're missing something, mm -hmm. we're, we're off key. I think a lot of people when you ask them about their heart, do a heart check and be like, hey, is this system, all this wealth that it's producing, is it really oriented in the right way? Uh-uh. I think I, my, I, I talk to people privately, they get it. Okay. And then, well, what is it? Well, what you just said, the oral indigenous relational world connection. If we can figure out a way to understand what's sacred, okay, and undercreate relational spaces that we join in that sacredness, that cultivate our true self identity and grow with each other with the autonomy and connection. I mean, that's a lot of it right there. You know? um, and when we look out at the leaders, the people on the shoulder and ask, hey, are the leaders clear on this pretty simple message? And is it ingrained in what we do? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. So, so as you say that, the first thing that came to my mind is is, is actually is extremely powerful, um, and be like, a, 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 this is a personal request. 
don't participate in the hysteria. Just as simple as that. You know, and, and it's like, I think there's like two or three steps. Mm -hmm. One step is don't participate in the hysteria. So I don't care what's up. I literally, I don't, I don't, I, honestly, even if like they're coming for your family with guns, don't participate in the hysteria. And obviously in most cases, that's not what's happening. So really don't. And that doesn't mean, by the way, don't be careful. Mm -hmm. There's a difference, right? Hysteria is hysteria. Um, then the second is something like, can you find ways to carefully actually have the, the, the consequence of reducing the amount of hysteria around you? And I think this is almost like a cadmium rod in a runaway nuclear reactor. Like, can you actually first don't, don't share your neutrons back out into the, into the reaction, but then second, can you actually begin the process of carefully? And by carefully, what I mean is sometimes unintended consequences get us, you know, bite us in the ass. Can you, can you slow things down around you and, and participate in discovering other people who are at least aligned, right? Share a same orientation and sensibility and then yep. doing what we're doing, collaboratively support each other and discovering better ways of doing it. By the way, I think we're about to enter into one of those Benita Roy things mm. where there's going to be a felt sense of like, okay, we're on the same team and there's some interesting insights that were just had, but now I'm going to go away and live my life and you're going to go away and live your life. But there's something about the basic flavor of that, which is everywhere in every way, endeavoring to create more peace and less hysteria, less craziness. Yeah. And then if you think about the hysteria machine, mm -hmm. if you think about like the thing that we're most concerned about, the level of politics and war and and the war on sense-making and weaponized propaganda and marketing, like fill in the blank, like whether it's, totally. you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, every time you choose to engage in the marketplace, think three times about whether or not the thing you're doing is A, what you really want and need. Mm. B, whether or not now is the time, whether it's really important, you know, just a minimalist impulse towards the less rather than more. And then finally, whether or not this particular artifact is really the best way of, of, of producing that in the wholeness that you can perceive. Right? Beautiful. Um, it's, not, it's not a lot. And, and, and it's okay to recognize that it's a gigantic world, but like being just a little bit conscious and just taking a little bit of time has an impact, right? It has an implication. And of course, increasingly, we can support each other. Some friends of mine up in Canada call it the SANE project, S-A-N-E, right? Just... Perfect. Can we move from an insane world to a more and more sane world? That seems like a nice, simple. And to recognize that we actually kind of live in a deeply, deeply insane world and to be an island of sanity is at least a very big thing and a hard thing to do. Yep. Um, and then the islands of sanity hopefully begin the process of linking up. Totally. And those links become stronger and more capable and more perceptive and then you start getting a real shift. Then our friends, the ones that we're concerned about, then it starts to become something we can really do because the energy begins to evaporate. You know, totally. They keep pushing the hysteria button and hysteria doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can begin to do stuff. I love it. Yep. I often use sort of this meter of reactivity. So you're, you're the hysterical one, okay? And then that's bouncing off stuff so people are reacting to that. And then I would come along and react to that. And then I learned, oh my God, I don't even need to react to that action. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well. And it, you know, it just occurred to me, I'm not sure what the facticity of this is or where, where I got it from, but I remember having, I think reading somebody who was talking about, like, if you actually go back and take a look at war, mm. where we have good records, and you kind of go back and track them. What you notice is that almost none of them were supported by the population until some event occurred that kicked the population into hysteria and a frenzy, mm. right? ubiquitously across the board. Right? Mm. You know, so I, I can say right now, categorically, I have no desire to be at war with Russia or China or Iran. <laughs> And I don't mean Russia and China and Iran. I mean the Rush, the people, the, people. the actual Homo sapiens <laughs> sapiens, the right. person. If, if we zoomed every one of those people, like, hey, let's talk. Like, <laughs> <"Tavarish."> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
have a cool and conversation. More or less. I mean, sometimes not, and that's okay. I mean, right? Yeah, that's fine. fine. There are plenty of assholes in the world, and, there are, and, right, I, and, I, right, and I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we need to go to war, right? right. We, can, we can take it slow, and you've probably got some friends who can talk us down. Um, so, so something along those lines, too. That's crucial. We actually could Zoom these people. Right? So I'm, you know, I'm waving the flag right now and saying peace. And to the degree to which somebody presents themselves as having the right and responsibility to declare war on my behalf, mm -hmm. no. And now how do we figure out how to actually have that handshake happen across right. those boundaries in spite of and without getting downward causation from? Right. Well, there is definitely nonviolence tracks and principles that are, you know, justification systems around nonviolent flavors that are very salient. And so I just want to create a nod to that. Hmm. Yeah. And I guess finally sort of sort of signing off, we've got a we've got a nice little piece of uh what was it called? Like drink your own Kool-Aid mm -hmm. right here. You know, the US of A is in the middle of a culture war. Hmm. Um, and it's a civil war. You know, some people might be like, oh, it's not a civil war. It's like, yeah, sure. World War I wasn't like World War II and World War II wasn't like the uh, Franco-Prussian War. Wars change. And this civil war is not like the civil war of 1860 because we live in a different world. It's a civil war. Um, and you can know it's a civil war by the degree to which it actually is showing up as breaking up families and friendships. And right? that's the very essence of a civil war is that it breaks the bonds of civitas. It breaks the bonds of relationality across fracture lines of ideology. Right. And I've so heard I it called to... the cold civil war. <laughs> yeah. It's the civil war in the context of mutually assured destruction. It's the civil war in the context of kinetic is no longer really valid. And we've gotten really good at fighting wars in different modes. Yep. So how do we solve that problem? Uh, you, you talked about even in like in your organization, something that, that wasn't going to be shared in this call, a civil war erupted across a fracture line. And, um, <laughs> and God, people are so fucking stupid. And the, the thing that we live in is so fragile and so difficult to actually really do and, and nearly impossible to replicate. Uh, but because we're unconscious of that reality, because we actually didn't um, play almost any role in producing it, and frankly, generally, generally play almost no role in maintaining it, yep. um, you know, we, we act with increasing levels of adolescence and, gener and generate the real possibility of real serious catastrophe. Totally. It might be interesting, at least if, maybe in some other call, I'm thinking about what I was trapped in, my belief in justification system. Okay. And why, because for me, it was, I was more in it than I am now. Like I, I was took, I took an adjacent step over. I mean, it took like six months. This was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but the retrospective is that I was in my paradigm. Okay. Of justification. And I believed in that. Okay. And I believed the extreme left was going crazy and they were contributing to the war. And I'm left. I've been left my whole life. All I do is help the poor. I'm a feminist. But you can't just look at Jordan Peterson and call him a transphobe. You will create a structure of chaos. So stop that. Okay. And then when they said stop it, I was like, no, I know that I'm right. I know mm -hmm. I'm justified. Right. And so now I know you're wrong and I'm not going to react to your reaction. All right. And that's what, you know, and then boom. And then, man, and then everybody because then something happened and everybody got frozen. Okay. And it was really intense because I mean, I've been directed there for 12 years. So I'm this powerful person. It's like, Oh God. So, and then it was ultimately like much of what we're much of what my lived experience, like around wisdom, energy, and some of our conversations are talking about a trans meta paradigmatics, like, Oh my God, step away from the justification. <laughs> I mean, me of all people, I have to learn that, but I did, I, I was in it. And I was, you know, and then I was reacting and I was neurotic and I got pissed off. Um, but, you know, that's, I, I learned definitely. So. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think it's you of all people, me of all people um, uh, in, in, in the day of the maybe shall be known as January 6th, I was watching what was mm. going on and okay. seeing exactly what you're describing mm. happening all over the place i.e. people dropping into righteousness. I am right. The frame, the paradigm that I have chosen to prefer and immerse myself in 
um, now hardens and creates a strong adversarial position. Mm -hmm. I'm very particular. That's wrong. That's right. That kind of a um, probably worth exploring in another video, by the way, exactly how that works in the context of how justifications work and why it's in, it's intrinsic to justification. It's intrinsic to complicatedness, but not intrinsic to complexity. Um, and intensity, right? So it wasn't just ubiquity of that, but also intensity. The energy that was being captured in that righteousness was large. And then implication, right? large degrees of intense righteousness historically leads to significant consequences. So it's like, all right, well, now of all times, anybody who's in a position of at least having at least once in their lives thought maybe becoming obligate um, partisans of paradigms isn't the right choice to do. Now is the time to test. Where are you on this? Let's check it. And by the way, <laughs> it's so funny. So I tweet, I said, had a Facebook post and maybe a tweet. Okay. And I said, like, right now on this day is a really good day to see um, you know, where you are. Mm -hmm. Most people, 90, 95% of people are going to double down on their paradigmatic commitments. I, mm -hmm. you know, not even allow themselves to have any flexibility, like really lock into it and increase their intensity. And that's, by the way, just a, I'm just proposing that just taking a look around empirically, that's what it's sure. going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, can you be part of the percent that doesn't do that? Can you actually step into the intensity of that, mm -hmm. recognizing the sociological consequences, the interpersonal consequences, and the intrapersonal consequences mm -hmm. of how mm -hmm. hard that is to do? As you said, it took you six months to sort of, uh, and like deal with the reality that we are deeply entrained and trained to defend our partisan positions. I, it's, it's a, if you don't, and you're in a system of justification, that's called being a loser, right? So it's really tricky to figure out how do you achieve a higher tone of that? How do you just, how do you not be a loser by giving up your righteousness and defending your position vis-a-vis -vis what in fact, everybody else is grabbing their swords, right? Everybody else is rushing to grab their weapons and you're like, no, no, no. How do you not be the one who just is the first one to die? Um, and it's funny because one might propose that by saying that, I am ipso facto implying that I'm one of the 5%. Mm. But that was not the case. Mm. Like the case was much like yourself. I am drowning. Like I'm feeling the energy of be a partisan of a particular mm. frame and interpret the world on the basis of that frame, pulling me, pulling me, pulling me. And just a small aspect of myself, it's like, come on, dude, you fucking know better, right? Mm. Hold the transparadigmatic location. Can you pull this off? And I found myself in a space of saying, okay, what's going to happen is it's going to take some time. Mm. And by the way, it's not going to be simple. Like I have to go into a deep process of stepping mm. back and like, you know, doing a lot of contemplation and putting myself mm. in new contexts that force insight and, and ingestion and things like that. And mm. for at least a month, at least a month, and maybe even, what is this now? Like we're- it's a month and three days. A month and three days, right? So at least I, I'm, I'm still not fully on the other side of that. I can tell you that right now, but it's at least was meaningfully metabolized. Um, and I think I may have gotten over the hump. We'll see. Uh, but the, the point being that that's the thing, right? That's we're, that's that's the thing. And by the way, I'm going to propose right now that that's going to increase in frequency and increase in intensity, although it will be more and more subtle also. It's just tricky. Like intensity doesn't necessarily mean, but a lot of intensity happens in a subtle way, which is even, even more invidious and difficult to navigate. But if you want to hold this trans-paradigmatic location, you got to have as a basic habit to be able to recognize that it's at the moments where the intensity is the highest that you have the most learning that is both necessary and available. Beautiful. Yep. Especially in <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's funny because, yeah, and, and, and you can always do the, you know, the simple epistemology. It's like, hey, guys, I mean, it's trivial. It's a trivial re realization that the amount of bandwidth that's available in any finite semantic construct, any paradigm, is effectively zero in relationship to the actual complexity of the underlying event. And that's, I'm talking about a tiny event, like an ant crawling right. across the ground. The more complex an event, the more meaningful the event is, the smaller any projection is going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of epistemologically obvious. Yep. Right? So if you're allowing yourself to become a hyper-partisan 
righteous defender of what you must know if you're at all intellectually honest is a minuscule projection of a vast more complex reality, then you're caught in something. Totally. Uh, I think you had contact, we had contact with Rob Scott. Uh, this we haven't a, talked yet. We haven't okay. talked yet. We're talking well, the, soon, like is, the next few days. This is fundamental shift, identity shifting for him. So you can, if you, it winds into what are our beliefs, what's our experience reality, and then what's a proper relation his whole life narrative is about that. Mm, nice. All right, man. Great. Good. I know. Yep. All right. The hyper conversation continues. The hyper conversation continues. Talk to you later. Peace.